Welcome to the Bikerian Podcast. I'm Eric. And I'm Aisla. And so for this show, we've decided, we've done an, another, you know, similarly lighthearted um, podcast in the past, but um, this is a new concept that we had because in all of our conversations, we realized we were saying dumb cliches and then actually bothered to ask the question, where did this dumb cliche phrase come from? Yeah. What are, what are we actually saying? <laughs> And so we did some research and compiled a list of um, phrases that are common or uncommon, but in varying degrees, utilized in modern culture. And so we wanted to have a little bit of a lighthearted conversation about where some of these come from. So I'm going to, I'll mention a phrase and I want you to tell me where you think it came from. Well, you can't go out of order on our list here. Oh, I can do whatever I want to. Are you going to? Okay. <laughs> so what do you think, where do you think the phrase butter you up comes from? Wow. Well, I mean, I can assume that there's a certain amount of cultural things around butter like salt. You know, salt has a lot of various different superstitions and that sort of thing. So I'm going to, I'm going to assume that buttering somebody up is some ancient thing where butter used to cost a fortune and only came from the magic cows in the field or something like that. That's a good guess. I like that. So I was a little tricksy in choosing this one first. It is the one that has the least amount of clarity in terms of history. Interesting. There are two different schools of thought and neither of them is particularly conclusive. So one of them, which is kind of boring, um, it has some force behind it is that it it's it's the image which of course doesn't mean anything to me of spreading smooth butter on a piece of bread is like sp spreading some nice words on someone so that's the that's one of the commonly believed origins okay which boring right um the other one which is really kind of fun is that it's related to in tibet and in india there were these old customs of crafting butter sculptures when, and they would be given to the gods or they would be put up on altars as a means of bringing happiness and peace in the coming year. So you create a little butter sculpture and then you're, you butter someone up. It's like you're creating a sculpture of them. And wow. I have to say that to them. both of those make no sense in our modern pop culture. They make no sense. So yeah. <laughs> but but that, I prefer the butter sculpture personally. <laughs> butter sculpture does make a certain amount of sense, but yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, that's the whole point. These are sayings that, that people will just say offhand and, you know, almost colloquially. We know what it means, we just don't know what it means. Or oh. where it came from. And this one seems very... This one, the India thing, I was wrong. In Tibet, it was the butter sculptures. In India, it was lobbing balls of ghee butter at the statues. That's what I like. <laughs> you just like standing there lobbing butter at something wow. to show it that you think it's, you know, powerful and awesome. <laughs> and I would say that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard. You'd be hard pressed to figure out how that would have made it into our English vernacular, except that India... And, and to some extent, Tibet was associated with England for so long. So and they might have actually brought that back. Yeah, they might have brought it brought it back from their conquering wow. of the world. So, uh, yeah, so I like I thought it was just kind of, but it was one of the ones, the other one, and I, I don't think I actually wrote it. Oh, it did. The cat got your tongue. This is another one that has a lot of, a lack of clarity around it. All right, well, then let's do that one next. So the cat's got your tongue. Well, where, where, and you've done the research on this, but I can where tell did you, where you I, think yeah, it I, came where from? Yeah, I thought it came from, honestly, from, you know, the first time I heard it was as a child. So I sort of thought of it as when you see a cat pouncing on something and they grab it. I, I thought it was sort of simulating that your, your tongue had somehow been captured and you couldn't talk. Right. And I think that's where exactly my brain went. You know, cat got your tongue, just like cats are mischievous and stuff. Yeah. From that point of view. like, And, and they're then, always pawing at things. And right. So why wouldn't they grab your tongue? So, um, and I'm looking, and the assumed origins actually come from a couple of different places. And again, you said it's not entirely clear, but the first one is that the English Navy 
uh, used to go around swinging a whip with multiple rope endings to keep a victim quiet called a cat of nine tails. So some of our more uh, experienced members of our audience might know what a cat of nine tails is. But uh, that's an interesting thing. And to be honest, um, something triggered in my brain when I read that that reminded me that that could very well have been what I had also heard about it, that it had something to do with a cat of nine tails and that... Well, it's a popular theory. What, what was interesting to me is I found a couple of different sites that talked about history. Now, this I didn't do any book research or reviews for this, so it was entirely Internet-based. So take that as you will. The, the I found this really cool site based in the U.K., right. and a lot of their information was cross-referenced. And it was really interesting to me that on this one, this background story of that they used to use a cat of nine tails to discipline sailors, and then after the whipping— People would say, oh, cat guy, you're telling me you're, like you're so beaten and in pain, you can't talk. Yeah. And there was this commentary on this site about phrases. It was like, that, of course, never happened. <laughs> I'm like, that seems awfully, I don't know, assertive. Yeah. They're like, of course, that's all fictional. <laughs> well, you know, it was on the Internet, so it has to be true. Yeah. So it just kind of was interesting to me that there might be, I mean, it, of course it could be fictional and they just seemed so certain that that was not even possible on this British site around phrases. So interesting. Yeah. And interesting that I think, um, just like the butter you up, I, I would be curious if that is actually comes from British colloquialisms. Um, because cat got your tongue clearly seems to have that same British twist to it. Like, I feel like we might have gotten it from that area. but Well, as John Oliver says, they were America's first draft. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then the second thing that uh, about Cat Cut Your Tongue, where it could have possibly come from, is the ancient Egyptian method of silencing blasphemers, cutting out their tongues, and then feeding the tongues to cats. Which is just dark and weird enough to possibly be true. But, um, you know, I find... The more research I've ever done on ancient Egyptian culture, the more that I've realized that just about everything we think we know about that. It's completely has, wrong. Yeah, it's all wrong. <laughs> and so whenever I read it was an ancient Egyptian thing, my my flags go up immediately like, eh, I don't think so. But um, an interesting concept. And the Egyptians did like cats. So I guess if they were going to feed them anything exotic, it might have been tongues. My question is, would they eat them? Does they, I mean, I couldn't find anything on whether or not cats Ask anyone like who's eating. passed out long enough if the cat tried to eat them, and the answer is probably yes. So I would say yes. Okay. that's. I, I feel like that's anecdotally accurate. I love my cats, but I am quite sure that if I were to die and not be discovered right away and they were hungry, I'm dinner. Well, I, that's fair. So. <laughs> um. So let's see. So my favorite one is the longest one. But I think I'm going to go for it. So the spade, calling a spade a spade. So let me qualify because this is actually the phrase that we brought up um, as one of the first ones we were talking about just offhandedly. And some part of me immediately just assumes that's actually some racist thing um, in, the, in, the, in the catch a tiger by the toe uh, vein. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, you can replace tiger with the N-word. And that is actually somewhat where that phrase has come from, and that's kind of actually well known. But uh, I didn't know that until my partner told me that. Really, I had never. I'd always heard it. Is now we're obviously deviating from our our spade a spade. Right, moment, but I've I've actually you know I the, always heard it. You know, catch a tiger by the toe, and then we started doing this. Yep. Although I started looking into this, and I asked him, like, what are things that you've heard? And so he recited that. And and said, this is how my family was. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, that was brand new information. I didn't. So I actually did a bunch of like reading on that one. And I didn't try to put it in because it's a little more complex. But it's definitely worth. I'll include a link to that in the show notes because it's definitely worth yeah. looking into. It's a really interesting phrase that has been it is. used in a lot of different cultures over a couple hundred years. Right. So, but, uh, but so suffice to say when, when we were talking about this and call a spade a spade, I, I, maybe it's my East coast upbringing by slightly racist parents. Um, but yeah, I just assumed that was when they said that, I just kind of assumed that was a somewhat racist phrase. So well, and there's it, my answer. So you're both, you are accurate and also it's not complete. So it originally came about 
the first reference to it is it looks like 1849 and it it actually meant um or wait no that's the wrong one sorry it the first one was a greek one and it was they actually f- took it back all the way to aristophanes and it was to call a fig a fig and a trough a trough and then it was translated to call a spade meaning a shovel so it was actually a, a, a right. originally about shovels <laughs> however during the um Renaissance, the Harlem Renaissance, 1920s, it began to be referenced as code for black people. So you're correct in that the modern, it's kind of like the swastika. It, it was originally a symbol for peace. And, and the people who used it as a symbol for peace are sort of offended in some ways that they can't use it that way anymore. In, and yet the cultural reference at this point is so clearly the the Nazi regime that you can't like that's it's too it's been too attached to this new meaning and I think the same thing with a spade a spade that even though the original meaning was actually a shovel it's it is now become right that a racist term well and, and probably should not be used there's probably other appropriate ways yeah that's a thing like I think I've always avoided saying that because it never felt appropriate and again just knowing certain older members of my family and and growing up and knowing that another related phrase uh, that would be occasionally tossed around was black as the ace of spades. Uh And I think that's where my brain just clicked on that being a, again, a slightly racist statement. Yeah. So that one of the articles on it said the, the really long one that sort of described the whole history said, you know, you can, you can try and, and insist that it's this Greek thing and, better to just find a a different phrase (laughs) that won't hurt you right yep uh wow you got a lot of notes on that one this one was weird our studio mascot is currently crawling around on my lap mr ghost has decided now is the time he needs attention Mm -hmm. at least he's not wearing his belt right now he is but it's quiet oh so this is the biting the bullet um, actually, I was going to ask you the oh, next one. You, you can ask me okay. biting the bullet. All right. I'm going to ask you about one that I, you know, I've heard this one surprisingly a lot of times and I did, I knew where it came from when you reminded me, but of course, and you've seen this, so I'm curious where you thought it came from. Um, sour grapes. They are enjoying their sour grapes. They're enjoying their sour grapes. Uh, yeah. I, I sort of thought it was a little bit more, um, descriptive or reactive in terms of this feeling of sort of puckering your face when you when you eat something sour like a an expression of distaste and that's not exactly what it is right where did you think it came from i didn't really remember so and and in the course of our research i was totally reminded and i totally remember it um aesop's fables the fox and the grapes right and so in, uh, in a lot of ways, um, I totally remember that because once he got hold of the grapes, he realized they weren't that good anyway because they were sour and he sort of regretted all of the effort that he put into it. Well, actually, it, so the version that I was reading was the opposite, that he didn't get them. And so it's that thing that you do when you don't achieve your goal and so you decide that what you wanted wasn't worth the effort. Right. So he he really wanted the grapes and he couldn't reach them. So then he decided, well, they must have been sour anyway. Sort of like it wasn't. It's no good. Right. Since I can't have it, it's no good. I guess I've heard it used both ways. Both in the you know, um, when when yeah, I guess when somebody disparages something that they couldn't get that they really wanted or something. Yeah, it makes so, sense. Um, but the puckered face definitely still works, right? It does. And now we're going to grab a photo real quick. <laughs> That's what you do. The cat is running around right, the studio. Yeah. Now, lighthearted, and apparently the cat knows too. So The, cat, now, the cat's figured that now out. Now we'll be able to post this in the show notes as well. There you go. Because everybody needs to see the cat. All right. But then you had brought up, let's see, we had Bite the Bullet next. We, yeah. That's like, so this one, um, in some ways, well, like, tell me what you think. Well, 
you know, I, I, I've always known what it meant, you know, to bite the bullet. I've actually, I think I've used it myself, even in my own internal head dialogue of, you know, I'm just going to bite the bullet and go and do this thing. It's like, it's not even necessarily a negative so much as just a, you know, pulling up your pants to go and do the hard thing or whatever, bite mm-hmm. the bullet. But, um, I admit, I don't really know that I've ever really thought too much about where it came from. So I, I had the, the idea of it being soldiers who couldn't have anesthesia, right? Like they had to bite something. Right. Usually you picture them biting a stick while they're having half their leg, leg amputated or something. Right. And so, and that's actually what is more likely. They didn't no, they were unlikely to have actually bitten bullets, which, you know, would be maybe dangerous. Although they didn't know lead was dangerous at any points in times when they were doing field surgery amputations. But so, so, but sticks were more likely, well, you know, also you just bite your tongue. They were kind of tiny, round little things. Right. So, um, so there's, when they go through the history of it, they were, you know, the, the, your definition accept the inevitable impending hardship and endure the result resulting pain with fortitude. And then there's a story of the surgery and that seems to have occurred it all as ba- far back as Rembrandt. Um, hmm. But it was more, more, a. Uh, but they're so funny. They're like, people may have been, biting things during surgery, but they were definitely also given, you know, drinks. <laughs> right, like that. alcohol. Ether was actually around, I think, a lot more early than a lot of people would assume. So there's there's a quite there's some looking back at those early surgery paintings and, you know, that none of that is happening, but people said it was happening around that time. So there's like, no, probably not. And then there is some instances of saying that in the early, in the late 1800s, that Kipling started saying that, and sort of, a, sort of in one in one of his books, and that's where okay. they started to equate it with the war and things like that. So, it it was either a literary phrase that came to be seen right. as real, yeah, or it it was perhaps you know the sticks and people just kind of translated that to. The whole bullet concept. Right. So this one was the most boring as, as far as I, you know, think. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, it's one of those things like I've, I've used it in my head for as long as I can remember, you know, just bite the bullet, yep. take care of that thing. But, uh, yeah. Interesting. Um, so. So. I want to do this one. Let's see. <laughs> I've I've got the and that's fine because this is one that I also brought up initially mm-hmm. when we were talking about this because I had no idea where it came from. Um, breaking the ice, and I mean we use that all the time, like icebreakers. You know, I mean there's a gum called icebreakers, right? Right. <laughs> Relating to making sure your breath is good when you're starting a conversation with somebody because you're breaking the ice with them. So when it's a very it seems very straightforward, and I always thought of it as like you know people had to break the ice to you know get to the fish in in the you know to do ice fishing or something like that. I I, I thought of it as a very functional. You can't you, you can't do the the rest of the thing. You can't do the rest of the social engagement if you don't break the ice to talk to people. You can't do the rest of whatever it is you're doing if you don't break the ice to get to the water. Right, um, and you're not far off. So. Um, that is where the earlier meaning of the phrase actually came from was, uh, forging a path to allow ships to connect, um, on trade routes and that sort of thing. Um, it's actually quite old and was first recorded by Sir Thomas North, uh, in his 1579 translation of Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Grecians and Romanes. Or Romanes. Anyway, yeah, so that you you actually kind of got where that did come from, but it, it's been around for a very long time, apparently. So. Well, and it sounded like it was less about, I was thought, I thought of it as like a fishing thing or something, and it was more about ships. Right. Um, and one version I read said something along the lines of it was actually about, um, there was a, a time that it was interpreted around kind of good relations. So that like ships from different navies 
would help each other out by breaking the ice. So right. it, it indicated some form of connection. Yeah. With, rather than sort of the efficiency aspect of, you know, this is necessary to get the job done or whatever. Right. So it's interesting. Yeah. That one, and, and again, like that one's so common. Like, uh, I don't think even people, like, that's just its own turn of phrase that nobody even thinks about. We have, we know exactly what that means to break the ice. Yeah. So, all right. And then you had another one? So this one is the one that surprised me the most. It's actually one of the things that made me think this could be a fun thing to do, which is probably sometime in the last six months, someone said to me uh, that the term being grandfathered fathered in right. was... Or the grandfather clause. Right. Was uh, actually a form of racial discrimination. And I was like, no, that can't be true. <laughs> And I admit, I, I actually know that that it is, and it does come from, although um, you probably have more details on it, but I do know it comes from um, post-Civil War, yeah. uh, freeing of the slaves, that certain uh, relationships, so maybe you can clarify it on that. So they couldn't, they couldn't prevent black people from voting. I mean, legally, they weren't supposed to. Obviously, there were a lot of intimidation tactics that were done in order to do that. Right. Um, this law was that it, they basically is after the 15th amendment since now blacks could legally vote they were trying to come up with ways that were sneaky to prevent that and so the grandfather clause was if your grandfather voted in you know a, an election then you could vote right so, yep. so of course, none of the freed slaves, none of their grandfathers had voted. And so, yep. <laughs> um, then, or you could register to vote and it was. But I believe this is now an official legal term, right? Grandfather clauses and things like that. And grandfathering in somebody like if you raise the prices, but you've got people on existing contracts for a lower price, then they can be grandfathered in. And I, I believe I've even seen that in legal terminology. So, so it has been, it has been become universally known and in some ways it's the opposite of like the spade is a spade where it started out as a racially uh racial discrimination attempt and has become something that is more benign however so the term grandfathered has become part of the language i don't know that it's necessarily become part of the legal code it's an easy way to describe individuals or companies who get to keep operating under an existing set of expectations when new rules are put in place. And that all sounds really great. Right. Um, and the a half a dozen states passed laws that made men eligible to vote if they had been able to vote before African-Americans were given the franchise or if they were the lineal descendants of voters. So that's where the grandfather right. clause came in. You know, you, you can vote, you can register to vote if your grandfather voted. And, um, and then the, most of the states that enacted them knew they wouldn't pass constitutional muster. So they, they adopted these grandfather clauses and they put a time limit on them. So they knew they would expire. Mostly what they wanted to do was try and get as many white people registered as possible using that law before it expired and preventing black people from being able to be registered at that same time. So it was a way to focus on you know, that. Yeah. Um, and it was ruled unconstitutional in 1915. So they were, many of them were enacted in the like, in late, early 1890s. So they were around for like 25 years. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, only because you don't think of the 1915 era as being much in the way of civil rights, but it seems like this might've been one of those early maneuvers uh, that led to the civil rights movement later on. Yeah. It's and it's one of those things that it's so funny to think of, you know, in terms of generations, like my great grandmother was alive and probably, I think she was a young child or had just barely been born around the civil war. Right. So it's not that far away right. for each of our families. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's amazing to think because we read and study all the history of the world and the United States entire history is pretty much a quick snapshot by comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, we're only two generations removed, you know, from things like the Civil War. That's just a fact. So, um, you know, the boomer generation defined the 50s and the 60s. And that's, you know. 150 years from the foundation of the country, essentially. So, right. So anyway, that was it was kind of fun to to look up some of them. I we looked up a lot more, but these are the ones that actually had some kind of substance going on. Well, and you know, it's an interesting subject, and I really enjoyed you know doing all the research on this. So I, I would love to um, you know if we get any comments on the show uh, from people to share other phrases that maybe we didn't look at this time or something like that so that we can look at it in the future. Um, yeah, that would be actually really great to get some input other than our own yeah. curiosity and, and our social network. <laughs> right, absolutely, as well as getting some comments on how many people would have guessed where some of these came from because certainly a lot of them surprised me. Welcome to the Bicurian Moment. So, this week, um, I have a little bit more of a lighthearted one. And it has to do with the fact that I have a very limited amount of spare time. However, I have been under the weather for several weeks, and that has led for some uh, time to catch up on TV shows. And the thing I'm realizing is that TV shows, specifically as a medium, whether it's from the various different products we've gotten from HBO over the years, like they really set a standard starting with the Sopranos and some shows even before that. Um, currently I've been watching and catching up on Preacher, uh, which is a fantastic show on AMC based I on the comic. the comic. Yeah. The comics are fantastic and they're really doing it justice. And it occurred to me like TV is way more than just a trashy pastime after a long day at work that you just flip on and, you know, maybe get into a bad sitcom or something. There's so much high quality going into it. It's, it's better than movies in some cases. So it's a very interesting thing to realize that something that, you know, has been um, panned for so many years as something, you know, there's, there's still, I still meet people that are like, I don't even own a TV, blah, blah, blah. But I watch these, all these shows on Netflix and, and all of that because it's really actually high quality. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a strange revelation. Yeah. Well, and that there's a, there's a snootiness for sure, right? Around pop culture and television and such. And yet the stories are really relevant. Right. And seeing how things are mirrored, there's a lot there. Well, I'm also seeing um, people taking, a, you know, a chance on these things that are books. Um, I'm, I'm one of those that read Game of Thrones in 1998 hmm. when the original book came out. Um, I knew George R.R. R. Martin was a TV writer and I was reading it with this idea that, man, this would make a really interesting movie or TV show or something. And was absolutely not surprised at all when it got picked up that way because I just knew with his experience as a TV writer for so long, if anyone could make that happen, he would. And he did. And then it opened up the floodgates. Like people started looking for obscure books, obscure, you know, sci fi, fantasy, um, you know, comic books came up in movies successfully so comic book you know tv shows and movies became very popular recently i feel like harry potter started the book phenomenon it might have but i you know that was and it was movies that i just feel like that's when well if you want to take it a step further back um most people probably weren't even all that familiar with tolkien when lord of the rings came out and so you know in that regard like like i feel like a lot of people probably had not been able to fight through that book series maybe they had read the hobbit but all of a sudden it opened up this door and, and, you know, that's when I really remember people suddenly going out and running out and buying Tolkien and they had never read it, you know? I still haven't. Oh, really? That's when, it, when you do two truths and a lie. That's always, that's always my lie. Now it's over, but, you know. Wow. Because no one, everyone's like, oh, you're so geeky. That can't be your lie. And I'm like, hee, hee, hee. <laughs> Interesting. So anyway, uh, just some revelation that I have had recently about the state of modern media. No, it's definitely, it's really intriguing 
because it doesn't necessarily feel like a, a diversion in the same way. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I watch TV and then I need therapy. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> so, it's true. <laughs> like, oh, wow, that was hard. And I, and I, you know, another thing I know um, for, for any of our listeners who don't know this, um, you have a thing about violence. And I'm realizing this show's on AMC, that there's no way that you would be able to sit through without looking through your fingers at. So, yeah, that that's the that's my world. Um, speaking of television and phrases, I, I'm going to bring those two subjects together in a in a neat little enclosure. Okay, like a hinge. We're watching John Oliver, and he was talking about some of the stuff that's happening currently around the Mueller investigation. Yes. And realizing how, you know, we have these phrases that are fun turns of phrase that we use, like breaking the ice. However, there's also a, a psychological phenomena where someone repeats something enough, you will just hear yourself saying it. Right. Like for, you know, in a, maybe a less benign one. I just remember when my kids were little, at one point I was very frustrated with them and I heard myself say, I'm going to beat you with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't want to say that to my children. It, but it just came out because that's what was said to me. Right. Yeah. It was automatic. I was in that situation. So I had to I had to work really hard to take that out of my vocabulary because it was a completely uh, not fought, like subconscious response to yeah. what was happening. And what's terrifying a little bit to me around the Mueller investigation is that Rather than coming at it from the the concept, this connective tissue we talked about on our last episode, episode as we're all Americans first before we're Republican or Democrat or Libertarian, we're Americans. And as Americans, understanding what exactly happened in the last election and if there was any kind of intentional or even unintentional collaboration so that we can look for that and, and create appropriate safeguards – seems to me like someone we should all something we should all be concerned about understanding. Absolutely. And I'm not assuming anyone at this point is or isn't guilty. I'm just saying I think that we really need to investigate that. And yet he uh, John Oliver was pointing out that there's a certain amount of phraseology, if you will, yeah. being put out there that is actually creating a, a public opinion downswing around whether or not that's important this is automatic the response. investigation you mean yeah yeah the, yeah no uh, yeah and and for those not familiar and we can post a link to the particular episode that we're talking about um but essentially he he was bringing up something and he, and, and he said a very valid point which was um most of his audience is probably not ones to turn tune into fox news and he made the point, here's why it's important that you should know what's going on over there. And he brought up the repetitive nature of the statements that they're making about um, how the Mueller investigation has no point and it's meaningless and all of that. And they're repeating this over and over and over to the point where um, people interviewed basically on the street or in focus groups were just parroting that back. Yeah. And it's changing the public opinion because when it comes to presidential impeachment, it really is that that really is a public opinion you know, we're the jurors, system. right? We're the jurors. Out. Yeah. And, and to me, the, it, it's unfortunate that it's so effective and it's something that I know, you know, I'll hear myself have like a, a reflex and, you know, the thing with my kids, but even of course, modern political things, I'll hear myself say something and I know those aren't my words. Like I'm parroting someone because yeah. I've heard it enough times and we all, we all do it. It's a, it's part of, being human and learning to acknowledge when that is happening feels important to me from, from all sides. Well, yeah. I mean, especially we, we live in a world where it's just as prevalent as, as it's ever been, although we can be hit by it more. But I mean, what we're essentially talking about here is a slogan, right? Yeah. I mean, make America great again is just as, you know, much of a parroted phrase and, and became, you know, the rallying cry between, you know, from that election and stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, you know, some of us have a distaste when we hear that phrase, but other people rally behind it. And we all know it. We do all we know all it. We all know it. And we know it like, you know, when, when people make fun of it, when they say, you know, make America tall again, we know what word they're replacing. It It's become... Like breaking the ice. Like breaking the ice. So thanks for listening. 
and you've got our little slogan here. I'm going to I'm going to say it this week. So if you have ideas, feedback, thoughts, please find us on social media, uh, by Kirian on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or give us a call at 720-507-7309. And you can also email us at podcast at bykirian.com. Have a great week. <laughs>